Income tax 2022-2023 depreciation and rental property tax software example. Let's do some wealth preservation with some tax preparation. Here we are in our example form 1040 populated with Lacert tax software. You don't need tax software to follow along, but it's a great tool to run scenarios with. You can also get access to the form 1040 related forms and schedules at the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov. We have our starting point, single filer, Mr. Anderson, 90210, Beverly Hills living in. And we're going to say that they have just the rental property so we can focus just on the impact of the rental property coming from the Schedule E, which is formatted in essence as an income statement. For the purposes of this problem, we're going to say it's 100% rental property. It's not vacation property. We're not personally using it or living in it so that we can just focus on depreciation here. We've got starting point, 120,000 of income, 20,000 of expenses to give us that 100,000 net income, which is flowing into schedule one, which is flowing into the first page of the form 1040, standard deduction, 12,950, 87,050 taxable income. All right, back to the schedule E, we're focused on the depreciation. Now, when support accounting instruction by clicking the link below, giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website, broken out by category, further broken out by course, each course then organized in a logical, reasonable fashion, making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a YouTube page. We also include added resources such as Excel practice problems, PDF files, and more like QuickBooks backup files when applicable. So once again, click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it. When we think about depreciation, the first thing probably that comes to mind is the building itself. That's gonna have the biggest impact typically uh, for depreciation in a rental property situation. And, and we have to think about that primarily when we first purchased the building or put it into place, because that's when we have to figure out what the basis is and so on uh, and pick the, pre the proper method. And then of course the software might help us out from that point forward once we properly put it on the books. And then there could be other depreciation for improvements and things like that, which we have to be careful from a bookkeeping standpoint to make sure that we pick out those items that need to be improvements as opposed to repairs. We might scan the repairs line item here to see if there are any like big items in there that look like they possibly should be categorized as improvements instead of uh, the repairs. All right, so let's first think about the property itself. So remember when we get the property, there's a couple ways that that might happen. We might just purchase the rental property, in which case it's the most straightforward type of situation because the purchase price adjusted for anything we needed to get it in place for service, increasing by those items is, is basically the cost or basis. But we could inherit the property, in which case we've got to think about, okay, what's going to be the cost? Is it the fair market value or, or at the time of inheritance or or the decease of the, of the, or we could get a gift of the property which again gets kind of messy because then the, the basis, you know, it's kind of linked to the basis of the prior owner or something like that. Did we convert the property from uh, our personal use to rental use? In which case you would think, okay, does it need to be fair market value or the cost? And if the fair market value is higher than the cost, you would think that it would have to be remaining the cost when it was personal property. Otherwise you would have that step up uh, in basis uh, kind of situation. And then you have the issue of breaking out between between the building and the the uh, the land. So let's think about that concept real quick. Let's say we purchase something. Uh, we purchase for purchase the building for two hundred thousand building and land the property. And then we need to break it out between between land and building and the question is well how do we do that because i'm going to pull this down we just paid two hundred thousand for it so one one way you might do it is to take a look at the prior tax assessment right the prior tax assessment for property taxes assessment and let's say the prior time when they assessed it 
the total amount was uh, 160,000. 160,000 for the total and they broke out between land and building on the tax assessment uh, 136,000 for let's say this is let's go house and then land and then the land was 24,000 for a total total of the 160 so we can use basically those percentages we can't use those same numbers because obviously it was at 160,000 but we can use like a ratio and i could say okay let's take this divided by this make that a percent and that's 15 percent versus this divided by this make that a percent 85 percent if i sum that up it's a hundred percent so that would be a common way that we might deal with this problem and say okay i'm just going to do the same thing here two hundred thousand times the 85 percent and then i'm going to take the two hundred thousand times the 15 percent breaking out the current cost that i paid for it 170 30 uh house to land this is the depreciable component this is the non-depreciable component so let's use that and then populate this into our depreciation schedule. So different softwares are, will look different, but but this, the concept will be the same. You've got your depreciation schedules, and I'm going to say that that we've got the house, and I probably should put the address, but I'm just going to put, you want to be as descriptive as possible, but I'm just going to go generic here and just say the house or the building is going to go to the schedule E, and the category is going to be the category is going to be a building date placed in service let's say it was placed in service on 02 uh 0203 uh 22. so we're going to be using the method that we're going to be using because it's a building will be a mid-month convention so it'll assume it was purchased in the middle of february the cost I'm going to say, and remember when we calculate the cost to get to that 200,000, we've got to take into consider whether, you know, the stuff that was, was necessary in order to make the purchase happened, including all the costs to go through escrow and stuff might be included in the purchase price, as opposed to being expensed, uh, at that point in time. But we're going to say 130, 170,000, 170,000. We're not, we don't have any 179 for it. It's going to be. The property is going to be 27.5 years straight line residential rental building. And so there we have it. And then the other is just land. So I can put on the books, even though it's not going to depreciate. Schedule E category will be now land. And 020322. And that's for the, what did we say? Uh, 30,000. 30,000 to get to the 200,000. It's useful to put both those on the books, even though the land is not going to be depreciated and we don't have a balance sheet on our books. So why do we need it? Because it's useful to tie into, of course, the purchase price. So in the future, when we sell or something like that, we can see what happened. The building versus the land can tie into the, you know, the purchase price. There's not going to be any depreciation on the land. So land, no depreciation. And let's see the result. So that pulls into our schedule E. We see the populated here. If I go into the depreciate, we don't have a balance sheet, but we'll typically have these depreciation schedules to help us to kind of see what is happening. So now we've got the building versus the land. And if we kind of analyze this, we say, okay, it's a house. The date was acquired here. This is the depreciable 170,000 is the depreciable component. And we're using SL straight line mid month MM 27.5, the life, the years it's going to depreciate over. And then the rate from the tables using the table method is point is that rate to give us the 5409. Uh, In other words, if I took the 170,000 times the 0.03182, there we have it. 
Now let's actually try to calculate it using a straight line mid-month convention to get a better understanding of what is happening. So it's a straight line method, so the start is pretty straightforward, 170,000 divided by the number of years, 27.5. That would be the amount if it was for an entire year, but it wasn't. We bought it in the middle uh, or in the beginning of February, but it's a mid-month convention. So we assume that we bought it you know, at the middle of February. So if there's 12 months in the year, we've got 12 months minus like a month and a half. So 12 months, like 10 and a half months, right? Because because we, we only had it for a month and a half. So we're gonna say, let's say divided by 12, and that would be the amount per month times 10 and a half months times 10.5. And that gives us about the same number. So that's what's happening. Now this one's a little bit easier to project into the future than if we were using a double declining method because we would expect we, we would expect the second month to be a full year straight line method, which was 170,000 divided by 25, 27.5. And we could see if I go to year two, year two is at that 6181. So that's pretty easy to kind of project out into the future easier than, you know, the double declining uh, methods to do that. There's no depreciation on the land. Now note that if you're if you're taking on a new client or something and they have rental property, this schedule might not always be attached, you know, to the return. You're going to need the schedule so that you can get the rental property on the books uh, correctly. So if you have rental property, I would highly recommend that if you have a new client, what you would like to do is is populate the stuff into the system as of the prior year so that you can then roll it over into the current year and make sure your, your depreciation schedules are populated properly and match the prior year and so that they should roll over to the current year uh, easily. Now, obviously the depreciation will continue until all of the 170,000 has been consumed uh, with, with in depreciation. We've allocated it all out. We've got a tax benefit from it because we, we got a deduction for the depreciation expense over the 27.5 years. And after that point in time, then if I go to like 2023, you can see part of it has been depreciated in the prior year. That means the basis in the property from a balance sheet standpoint is 170,000 minus the 5409 minus the 6181, right? And, that depreci and that's the depreciated part uh, that has not yet been depreciated that represents current tax benefit uh, into the future that we're going to be getting into the future either in the form of depreciation or if we dispose of the property then when we sell it the 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 we're going to take the sales price minus this basically adjusted basis in the property including also including the land so in other words we we would like to have the adjust we would like to get the expense as soon as possible so we would like to write off the whole 200,000 this year, oftentimes if we could, but they won't let us. We have to put it on the books as an asset, run the depreciation schedules. Then we would like to have the depreciation life as short as possible so I can get the depreciation as early and I'd like to have an accelerated depreciation method if we could, but in general, they won't let us with the land. We have to put it pretty long life, 27.5, and then uh, the straight line method. Now the 170,000 higher basis is usually good. We want the high basis uh, for, for the, cause that represents tax benefit into the future. The lower the basis goes, it's good when we lower it because we're getting a tax benefit. We're lowering the basis, getting a tax benefit. But the lower the basis is when I sell it, that means that we're gonna have, we're gonna have a gain, more likely to have a gain. Gains are bad for taxes cause it's income or we're likely to have less of a loss. Losses are actually good for taxes because we might be able to reduce, you know, other income, you know, with the loss. So that's the general idea. Now, the other thing is that's common is that we might have improvements. If we have improvements in the property, you would expect, you, you might say, hey, I would like to just expense them like as repairs, like the common roof example, where I'd say, hey, let me just expense the whole roof that I put in place right here. But, then if you replace the whole roof, they're going to say, well, no, it's an improvement. Well, if it's an improvement, then I've got to put it on the books, possibly as an asset. 
Asset acquisition. Enemy agent disposal. And I, and I, if it's an improvement, I, I might have to depreciate it over the the same, in essence, useful life uh, as if the real estate was put in place at, at this point in time, the 27.5 years. Now note that that some situations could come up if you're putting in stuff like a like a heating system or something like that and you're like well maybe it's if it's not permanently attached to the home or something like that maybe i can call it not an improvement and if i can't if i can't just call it a repair and depreciate it i would like to depreciate it over five or seven years as opposed to 27.5 years that would be more beneficial so you run into these kind of problems as well right i would like to record it as a repair so i can get the expense now if they won't let me record it as a repair do i have to depreciate it over 27.5 years straight line method or can i can i somehow get it categorized as five year seven year property so i can have an accelerated depreciation method at least or even better take a 179 deduction or a a, a special depreciation allowing me to take it you know sooner would be the the idea but if it's a standard improvement we, we'd say and usually the improvements are going to happen not in the same year that we purchased the home but let's say we had an improvement so in, improvements and again you probably want to be a lot more specific you would on your descriptions to, so you know exactly what the improvement was so that at a future time when you when you sell the home or something you can figure out your adjusted basis for the sales price which will typically be the house the land the improvements and you can back up those improvements because you can go and find you know the the documentation of the improvements that were put in place so we're going to say this is going to be going to schedule e as well this is going to be for improvements so I'm going to say it was 11 15 22 15 thousand and I'm going to use that maker's a 27.5 year straight line, which is the same method as with uh, the house. So now if I pull back on over, we've got that populating here. If I go to my 2022 depreciation schedules, we now have another category with the improvements. So the improvements here calculating another $68. You can see how, how much the improvement is reduced because the 15,000, a fairly significant dollar amount, if I got to expense it in the current year, uh, would be would be $15,000 versus if I have to expense it over 27.5 years, significantly less $68 over 27.5 years, which will still add up to the 15,000, but I have to wait a lot longer to do that versus if I was able to categorize it somewhere else or populate it in 179 deduction or a special where I would get more of it up front in those cases or if I can populate it somewhere other than you know the 27.5 year property like a five year or seven year I would get an accelerated method possibly double declining or something like that and be able to depreciate it not over 27.5 years so you can see the incentives from a taxpayer perspective I would like to not have to capitalize it, not put it on the books as an asset, take the 15,000 as an expense, repairs or something if I could, or get a 179 deduction or special, which would basically have a similar effect, or uh, have a lower life and an accelerated depreciation, double declining if I could, or seven or five years, and then, and, and rather than having a longer life with a straight line kind of method would be the general thought process but obviously the tax code is going to restrict us now also remember that we might have had a loan on the property right if i had a loan on the property and had uh points on the loan so I, if i go over here i would expect if i had the rental property that i would have a, a loan on it and you would expect for me to get a statement for the interest statement right so I'm, i would have mortgage interest not going to schedule a but rather being being an expense here so let's say we had interest mortgage interest and let's say it was it was you know thirteen thousand or something like that but we might also have points that we discussed a little bit uh in a prior presentation which are kind of we can think of them as basically the advanced advanced payment uh of interest 
So, so we, we should get to deduct the interest then, but the fact that it's advanced, the IRS doesn't like those, those advanced payments. They think you're taking advantage of taking the deduction sooner rather than later. So we might have to put the points on the books, which again, really only happens when you first buy the property or something or take out the loan. So you might have to depreciate basically points. And the general idea with the points would be that uh, you're, let's take, let's go to the depreciation schedule. If that was to happen, you're going to say, all right, got to depreciate the points. So let's add another one and then points. You'd probably want to be, you would want to be quite specific on the loan and possibly the last four digits of the loan number. So you know which points you're talking about, where it's tying to. So if you sell the property or refinance, you can properly deal with the points at that point in time. And so we're going to say, this is going to be so let's say we, we're going to amortize it and we're going to say that there's a thousand dollars in points. Now there was a calculation we can look at and say, well, were the points significant or not? If the points are fairly small, fairly insignificant, then we can basically just use a straight line method to allocate. So in, in other words, the question is what method am I going to use for the points? Well, I'm not going to tie it to the property. It's not going to be that 27.5 years. I'm going to tie it to the loan. And then you'll note that when, if you were to be really accurate about it, when you look at the loan payments, the amount that's allocated between principal and interest actually changes. So if we were to be really accurate with the points, we would have to do a calculation to have a different amount of the points being, being uh, amortized each period. But if the amount is insignificant, maybe we could do the easy thing, which is to just do the straight line method over the life of the loan. So let's say this is a 15 year loan as opposed to a 30 year loan. We, we may be able to just say, okay, I'd like to just do a, a straight line method. And then I'm just going to populate over 15 years. So if I go back on over, that's another item that we might have included. So now we've got the amortization of the points that we're dealing with. And again, it's a fairly small amount of 61. It would be even smaller if it was a 30 year loan. I wanted to make it 15 so it doesn't look like we're amortizing it over like the 27.5 years similar to the building but rather uh according to the to, to the life of the loan all right and so then the next thing that we might have depreciation related to so if i if i go back to my uh schedule e are are things like equipment or, or stuff like that that that's not improvements but we're going to put them in there as three-year property, five-year property, seven-year property. Again, from our standpoint, if I can allocate something as repairs, more repairs, I would like to do that. If not, I would like to not call it improvements, but rather call it three, five, or seven-year property if I'm able to do that because I'm depreciating over a shorter life, getting the expense sooner and possibly able to use a 179 special deduction and or the the accelerated depreciation methods. So if I do that, let's go over and say that that we had something like equipment or something equip that we're using for our rental business or whatever. It's going to be it's going to be uh, going to three, and then we're going to say this is going to be uh, machinery and equipment. Let's say. And we're going to say, let's say this is going in as of 7071522. And let's say that it is 8,000 for the equipment. So now I'm going to say, I'm going to say this is five year property. So if it's five year property, we got to be careful with the auto limits. I'm not going to choose the straight line. Usually I'm going to choose makers five year property because that gives me a double declining. I could opt to use a straight line if I wanted to, but usually you would want the maximum that this default because that's going to give you the double declining method. Now also note that if I just do that and I pull over here and I go into my, I go into my depreciation schedules and let's see the full schedule. So, so uh, now we've got amortization, building improvements, land, and we have page number, where's my equipment? And the equipment, there it is. The scroll down is quite slow. So we had, we've got the equipment and it, and by default, it took the 179 special. So it allows us to depreciate all of it up front. Great, usually that's quite good. 
uh, oftentimes. So if you can get the special depreciation or 179, that's usually beneficial. Uh, if you can't do that, the ones the, then you might be able to take the 179 uh, deduction. So if I was to say instead of the special, I'm going to take the 179, 8,000 on the 179. If I'm able to do that, you have a similar kind of scenario, which in essence allows you to kind of expense it up front, right? Basically allows you to just expense it. Why didn't you just let me? Why don't you just let me call it? repairs or expense or machinery expense or whatever if you're going to let me do that right but so 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 you can get into the to the weeds and nuances of the 179 and the special uh, depreciation but you would think as time passes those are more political things that are trying to manipulate the economy and make people people look good and stuff like that so you would think that those may come and go but then the underlying depreciation will remain. So let's remove that just to look at the maker's depreciation and see it that way. So I've now elected, and basically the way it works is that if you have the 179 deduction, you take that and then it, and then it'll, if you don't take that, it'll default to the special deduction. And then if you elect not to take the special deduction, which you wouldn't normally do unless you expect future years to have more revenue than the current year, in which case you're gonna say, hey, look, I'd rather get the benefit in future years when my tax rates will be higher due to the progressive tax system. But then we can see we get this double declining. So you can, you can compare this. This one up here is the straight line mid-month convention, 27 and a half years. This is a 200 dB double declining method, in essence, HW half year convention uh, that, that we have for five years. And so if I was to calculate that, then it would be something like, okay, 8,000 divided by five, that would be the straight line rate it matches, but this is for six months. This is for a full year. So so if I was to say, okay, if I divide this by the 8,000, the rate is 2%, which I can also get by taking one over five, double the rate times two, because we're doubling it, 40% times, 8,000 that would be the amount for the full year if it was for 12 months rather than six months then I divide it by two to get the six months that's where that 1006 is it looks the same as straight line but it's not and we could we could see uh, in 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 year two what we would have to do is take the 8,000 minus the 1600 is that times the 0.4 which is 25. And so we could see that calculation uh, over here for year two. There's the 2560 uh, in year two. So it's a little bit of a, well, it's a much messier calculation than the straight line. Although the half year is a little bit smoother than the mid uh, month convention. Now, the other common issue that you have is the same kind of issue with the schedule C, and that's gonna be the auto and travel. So, so the question there is, are you going to be using a mileage method uh, or are you going to be using a direct method? If you use a direct method, then you, you have some limitations for the, the auto oftentimes for it to, because, because they don't want to allow you as big a deduction up, up front with the auto limits. So if you're using auto, then three, it's going to be automobile. It was in 020322. Let's say it was 20,000 auto. And we're going to say then we've got the straight line makers five year auto limits. So that's the main thing that you want to note here that we have those the the audit limits in place. So I don't want to dive. I don't want to go into them in, in a a lot of detail, but you can you can imagine the same kind of problems with the auto that we have with the Schedule C, which is that do, do I want to use the percentage method? Do I want to use the direct uh, method? If I use the direct method, I've got the depreciation and I still have to think about do I need to allocate it between the rental and the personal uh, kind of situation? Also, which of those two methods are going to be most beneficial for me to to take? And uh, that will depend on not just the current year, which oftentimes will be the direct method, 
but if you use the direct method in the current year, it could lock you into using the direct method because the IRS is skeptical of you taking more depreciation in period one and then switching to the to the mileage method because then you'd be taking a big lump sum up front and then you'd get the added benefit of the mileage method which is supposed to even everything out so so that's where you're a little bit limited you got to plan out into the future as to whether or not which method would be better the direct method or the mileage method